Hey guys, what's up? Aru, the fake sky, the rule of death, the system of Shbalanke, and the final battle against the abyss. These are all great revelations in lore, but I think there's a small, tiny part of Natland that you guys might have missed. And it's what I like to call the biggest glitch in the vat, created and bargained for by the very first Archon when he established the Sacred Flame. Yes, I'm talking about the rule of death and how it is not only the key to preserving the rise and fall of civilizations, which we've seen from the Nartes and Kreutz, but also to defeat the seemingly unkillable foe of life. A glitch that not only has the celestial power to defeat the abyss, but also to subvert the rules of death and the heavenly principles is rules of erosion and civilization. Today's video is about the Night Mother's possible true identity, the cosmic determinism of fate in Tevat, the glitch in Natland system, and the rule of death as not just a power to deny death, but also to kill what is virtually unkillable. We're adding a little spin to the outer god Yogsa thought with this one, so be sure to get your lore books out. Timestamps will be where people dream of dreaming. Let's get started. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the lore of Genshin, the name Night Mother has only ever been mentioned in the book Pale Princess and the Six Pygmies. And this godforsaken book speaks of a cruel Night Mother and the Land of Night. The Night Mother was the source of all sins and that the Land of Night was the embodiment of all her evil. In this Land of Night, there was one place that irritated her the most, the light of the moonlit forest. A place free from the Night Mother's rule and the only place where people can bask in the light of the moon. People in the moonlit forest had fair skin and light colored hair as well as bright blue eyes. With the book claiming that a lack of sunlight and nourishment of the moon made them as beautiful as they are. Now let me pull you out of Genshin Impact and put you into the older Hoyo game Gun Girl Z. Now in the older Hoyo game Gun Girl Z, there's a Cthulhu outer god named the Night Mother. Known as the Mother of Stars, Hello Stellaron, is an outer god that wants to restart the universe and rebirthing it into a single point. You can think of it as wanting to restart the Big Bang. Again, Hello Stellaron. This character or archetype I think is similar to the Honkai's god or leading entity, yogg -Sothoth, which is another Gun Girl Z character that is omniscient and can destroy anything with mere words. And we all know how powerful words are in the world of the Vat. Another thing about yogg -Sothoth is that she can erase you from the past present and future. Basically removing your entire existence, which is akin to what Ruka the Scaramu Wanderer has done, as well as what Mawika says about time. Now, Yogg Sothoth in Gun Girl Z is known as a tier 0 outer god titled as Boundless, and her name can be seen within Genshin as Goy Sothoth, which we can possibly assume as either a leading deity of the abyss, or maybe even the very god of the abyss itself, the Night Mother. Within in Genshin Impact, the Night Mother as well as this book is a known character throughout the history of Tevat a fairy tale told throughout the ages. And as we know, fairy tales in Tevat hold a special allegorical meaning that hides the truth of the world, hiding it in allegorical form. This is to avoid the rewriting of history from the Ermin Soul, a phenomenon which we've seen more times than we dare to know. If the Night Mother is an allegorical name, then she might simply be the air quotes origin of the abyss both as a spawning pool of which all abyss creatures come from, but also an abyssal entity that incites these creatures to infect specific worlds. Much like the Hersher of the End in Honkai Impact, the Night Mother is a Mother of the End in Genshin, a cyclical phenomenon that awakens when worlds arise and then slumbers when worlds finally fall. As a recurring event, we can easily connect this to the rise and fall of civilizations in Tevat, which is greatly tied to both forbidden knowledge as well as hubris and desperation for self-preservation. Uh, that's a lot of words. One such example is the cyclical world ends of Remoria, Hyperborea, and Nam. Natlantean, of which has been studied by our friends in the Nartes and Kreutz Ordo, the samsaras of multiple worlds, and that the final world is Tevat. And fittingly too, we're back to Sumeru with the Subzerus Festival, and most importantly for Natlan itself, the glitch in the system which was created by the first Pyro Archon, Shibalanke, and is now being saved by yours truly, Capitano, who if you don't already know is actually a survivor from Conria. His knowledge of Renova's rule of death isn't just a ploy to save Mawika's life, but also extends to his knowledge of saving civilizations. 
His experience from Kanria's fall, his curse of immortality, and even his knowledge from the Saritsa and Piero, both of which we can greatly tie to Kanria and the Cataclysm. Natland specifically, as a root civilization in the current era, is honestly one of the reasons why the Abyss attacks are greatest in Natland. Not just as a concept of war for the region, but because the knowledge of previous eras can be stored within the Sacred Flame. Which if you could remember, Natland suffered the most and had its ley lines basically destroyed. Imagine the memories that could have been taken from the Leylands and preserved into the Sacred Flame. If the rise and fall of civilization is imminent, then maybe the fate of Natlan as well as Tavat is indeed death. Now back to the same question, who or what makes sure that these civilizations rise and fall? The answer is the same thing that infects those same civilizations. The End The Night Mother The Abyss the universe's cyclical world enders, quite similar to Honkai Impact's world but also quite different as its protectors aren't just humanity but also the celestial gods who caged us in this false reality. The same false reality that our sibling wishes to break us free from, and the same false dream and sheltered eternity that Dane's Leap speaks of in the earliest teasers of Genshin Impact. Now let's talk about a fun term that I'm going to declare for the lore of Yenshin, Cosmic Determinism. Within the first games of Hoyoverse, the concept of End is quite prevalent as it's the key antagonist for their games. The Honkai and the Abyss have also been theorized to be the same in some fashion, from world building lore and theories to the Fatui to the Abyss and the Archons, all of which starts from the rise of civilizations and then ends with the fall and succumbing to some form of abyssal power or knowledge or a desperate attempt to become immortal or ascended in some way, both of which resulted in the fall of civilization regardless. But all of these are examples of the fate of civilization and a pretty common occurrence in Hoyo's games, at least before Honkai Star Rail. And with their games that do have a doomsday, the only way it ended is by embracing the end as what happened with Honkai Impact. Embracing the end not in a sense that we should succumb to the abyss, but to face that end. Determinism states that all events that happen including human decisions are causally inevitable. This basically means that the fate of the world through cause and effect will always happen. One such example is the prophecy of Fontaine, the death of the Hydro Archon, the flood and the washing and absolving of sins. However, this is much different to the rule of death and the powers of the divine to ensure death. As mentioned before, death is a rule and fate is an outcome. In cosmic determinism, humans have the ability to make their own decisions knowing that one day that cause will give an equal inevitable effect. This is a pure metaphysical theory of how Celestia uses visions and the Archons' power to change the future in small but largely impactful events, which we can see in the free will of humans in Tevet to forge their own destinies. Humans' abilities to dictate their own fate is not a free will, sadly. We know that visions serve a higher purpose to change fate in a long distant future. And these exact events that change the future can be assumed to happen today. Despite the air quotes end of the world that is constantly creeping into Tevat, destined to plunge it into the chaos and the regret as mentioned by Skirk and her masters' belief in the abyss. In a sense, the world of Tevat is living in a sort of eternal samsara, a sheltered eternity. And the inevitable end of the world is exactly what Celestia is trying to keep from us. But at the same time, it is also that exact revelation that our sibling is trying to uncover. Which might be the reason why they decided to be the prince or princess of the abyss. I mean, if the world is stuck in an eternal samsara, would it not be unethical to keep them there and unable to break? free. Natlan is one of, if not maybe the only civilization that managed to keep itself in a loop of rise and fall without losing on crucial knowledge of its past mistakes. I mean how else can Mawika know of Renova, the Night Lord and the Dragons and the Heavenly Principles as war without having to be punished for knowing such events. Events that even the Orobashi from Inazuma had to be punished for, and knowledge that had to be kept under wraps in Enkanomiya and being renewed into Watatsumi. And today, in Netland, that same knowledge of the broken world goes back to Inazuma and Enkanomiya's lore about the ancient civilizations and of the ley lines. 
which Balanke knew of the war between the Primordial One and the Dragons, and would likely have known of the second war that included the second one who came. But yes, Natlan seems to have preserved memories from thousands of years ago, and it's through the same flame that powers its Archon and is fueled by the very culture of the Natlanese people. The Sacred Flame, the Contending Fire, the Pyronosis, the Night Kingdom, and the also Primordial Phlogiston. And Big Chedge Balanke thought of this exact glitch. A glitch in the system of Celestia that is also managed by its own rules. This goes back to the concept of cosmic determinism where one's actions will create an effect in the future. And Spolanke's action caused a repeating ripple of passing memories to the next generation and bypassing the powers of Celestia to erase memories, which is erosion, known to be the very reason we don't have a proper recorded history and is also the reason why every lore in the game is labeled as fables and fairy tales. Now if you think about it, the rule of death might not be as bad as it seems. All memories of Mawika will be stored into the sacred flame as long as Mawika makes her death be the sacred flame. It's a rule and not an outcome. So Mawika can choose however she wants to die. We know from Mawika's friends, Wanjiru, that once you become an Archon, you also inherit all the knowledge stored in the sacred flame. This not only floods your mind with the truth of the world, much like Full Metal Alchemist, but it also over overloads your small human brain with knowledge that isn't bearable by conventional means. In simple definitions, information overload is a state of being overwhelmed by the amount of data presented for one's attention or processing. And quite similar to what happens with Mualani and Ororon, as well as the rest of the chosen awakened heroes, this also happens to Mawika and whoever else becomes an Archon, cranked up to 1000, or maybe 6000 depending on how long ago Shbalanke started that system. But dreams and memories are the key to maintaining that mental overload. We've seen Nahida controlling people through dreams and thoughts, and now Mawika dreams in the speaker's chamber, where the Archon can stare at the sacred flames while controlling her overflowing memory within her dreams. But what does this have to do with death as a rule and the fate of Natlan? You see, Shbalanke perfectly designed Natlan's sacred flame and the rule of death to be held accountable only by the Archon. But if the Archon were to betray that deal between Renova and Shbalanke, then the rule of death would be placed upon the entirety of their region. So as a rule, using the power of death, a celestial power that is unattainable by any Archon, they can protect their region against virtually any foe, but at the cost of one's life. This is the second trial that a mortal must go through before truly becoming the Archon. First is the awakening of one's inner flame, which is only the size of humans' potential. But the second is the rule of death, where the power inherited from Renova does not change. A constant amount of power of a celestial shade. And is also the power to tip the scales of fate using the power of death. Death is a rule, yes, but if you inherit the power of death to make your enemies dead and your allies undead, then you have now ensured the survival of your civilization. This is another glitch that Shibulanke managed to create in Tevet's system. If the Abyss is an unkillable and undying entity that can and will devour all life, then inheriting the power of death and using it on something that cannot die, then you practically made the Abyss into a killable foe. Lastly, I want to talk about the quote that Dane Steve mentioned way back in the Travail teaser, since this explains the fake sky more than we think. In the perpetual meantime of a sheltered eternity, most are content to live and not to dream. But in the hidden corners where the gods' gaze does not fall, there are those who dream of dreaming. Now this is entirely theoretical, so hold your saurians. Get it? Because there's no horses in Tibet? Anyway, the perpetual meantime of a sheltered eternity is the constant samsara of Tevat, the cycle of worlds and civilizations that rise and fall. But now that eternity is actually a limitless, but also a finite amount of time and is only as quick as vision holders and archons can harvest their fates. Remember, visions can change the fate of worlds thousands of years away, as well as fulfilling the goal of Celestia, which I think is to prolong that sheltered eternity. But now, we're at the last samsara, which means that fate is not changing fast enough or that there aren't enough routes of fate where Tevat survives. Doctor Strange, basically. 
most are content to live and not dream are the people of Tibet that aren't awakened to the truth of Celestia's false eternity, the false sky, the sheltered eternity, the dream of gods. But in the hidden corners where God's gaze does not fall, there are those who dream of dreaming. This is a place where the gaze of gods does not fall, namely outer space. Not the abyss, but the place where the abyss dwells. The abyss isn't the outer space itself. It's an entity within outer space that devours worlds. This is based on the Narwhal's lore, which is the experimental pet of Certology, or Enjo, my favorite character. But similar to Conria, outer space is also where humans can be free to dream of dreaming. That is to make their own fate and create their own eternity. One example is the Witches of Hexen Circle, as well as the Five Sinners. Not exactly an enemy, but not really a friend either. But they have in themselves managed to be free from Celestia as well as from the Abyss, finding a loophole that they can exploit and be free to do as they please. Now, with that knowledge, let's go back to Shbalanke's deal with Renova. No, a fear of death is ingrained in all living things. If the wielder of this power cannot conquer their fear, Countless innocent lives will be claimed in their stead, for only then can the price be paid. Those are the rules. Mine is a nation that will not yield to the Abyss, and it will certainly not yield to your rules. As their culture and civilization is transmitted through the generations and their faith grows, the people will go from strength to strength and reach heights that even I cannot dream of. Dreams of dreaming, strength to strength, and the transmission of civilization through generations. This is the glitch that Sbalanke has created to subvert the rules of Celestia as well as defeat the Abyss. I dare say that Sbalanke still lives within the Sacred Flame and is waiting to be revived, and he already has. Not in the form of himself, but through the many Archons that rose to shoulder the overwhelming power of the Divine Throne and the Rule of Death. The perfect system made for mortals to truly ascend to Godhood. A flaming system that Celestia themselves might have failed to do, and one that the Abyss is now trying its hardest to extinguish. Now, the reason for the Abyss to be this involved is not because Natland is the most exposed area, but because it's the region that poses the most danger to the Abyss. And the Abyss, whatever or whoever that might be, Night Mother, Outer God, or Aeon, they know. And they want Natland destroyed. The next region we're going to meet in the future is Sneznaya, and I think the Saritsa is also exploiting both Abyss and Celestia, particularly through delusions, which if you could remember the lore behind that, and the special features of the Gnosis. The Exodia of the Saritsa and the Gnosis is honestly not exactly crazy to think about anymore, but I'll talk about that in the next video. And there we go, a theory on the fake sky, the abyss, the rule of death, and the exploits of the Chad Archon that is Shbalanke. Now if you've watched all the way to this point, then I suggest leaving a like, commenting below what you guys think, as well as subscribing and hitting the bell icon for more of my content. So, what do you guys think? Are we reaching a new peak in Genshin lore or is the Abyss more omnipotent and powerful than humanity and Celestia? Now I think I've talked about the Outer Gods enough already and even managed to squeeze in the god Enjo into the fake sky and the Hexen Circle and the Sinners. So maybe we can talk about more mundane and inconsequential topics this time. Anyway, that's it for me. I'll see you guys in the next video, yeah? As always, like, comment, and join. Subscribe to the bell for more ramblings and stay mad theorists. Bye!